All right, we have everyone back. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to this uh, very special Dawn Hangout. We will be talking about the Dawn mission and Hubble Inspired. Uh, we have a whole bunch of awesome people here. Um, so why don't I get started? Oh, Judy. Bye, Judy. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, Brittany Schmidt down on the end here. Hello. Hey there. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, so we'll be talking uh, some about uh, the the Dawn mission uh, that finished up uh, its imaging of Vesta and it's on its way to Ceres and how it's been inspired by images of the Hubble Space Telescope. And we have our very special guest with us today, uh, Zhang Yang Li. So hello, Zhang Yang. <laughs> hello. <coughs> Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh, it's fine. <laughs> and Max Muchler. Hello. Who's the is working. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, we also have Whitney Cobb, who will be uh, answering your questions on Twitter. So you can ask uh, questions of her at, at NASA underscore Dawn on Twitter. Uh, she'll be monitoring questions there, sending in uh, questions to the broadcast. You can also ask questions or leave comments on YouTube. You're watching this on YouTube on the Google Plus event page. Uh, and also using the Q&A app through Google Hangouts. We'll be monitoring that as well. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming. Um, why don't we get started with a little introduction of, of our guests. Uh, maybe you can introduce yourselves, tell us what you do, and uh, maybe just a brief overview of, of your work with Ceres and Hubble. Jiang Yang, do you want to start? Sure. Um, okay, so um, my name is Jian Yang, as we call that, and uh, I, I'm working at Planetary Science Institute as a research scientist. And uh, my research in interest is um, on small bodies, um, asteroids, and comets, and I now work on Dawn mission as a participating scientist. So um, I started to work on Sirius like um, seven years ago in 20, 2005 when I was still a PhD student. Very cool. And Max? Yeah, I'm Max Muchler. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. And for those of you that don't know, that's where we control the mission of the Hubble Space Telescope. So I've been working on the entire Hubble mission. And I'm an expert on Hubble's cameras. And I work with a fair number of people in the planetary science community, including the Amazing Dawn team, uh, which you know I think it was back in 2006 when I started collaborating with uh, you know this team. And we started generating. Well, there was earlier Hubble observations back in the 1990s and earlier, but that's when I started a uh, series of observations going back, you know, to, from the mid-2000s and uh, continues to today. Cool. And Brittany, of course, our, our lovely co-host for all of these, these Hangouts. <laughs> Hey. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Schmidt. I'm an assistant professor here at Georgia Tech in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I'm a member of the Dawn Mission Education and Public Outreach Team. Um, and I'm really excited about today's group of people because actually um, they're part of the reason that I got my PhD and how I got my PhD. Uh, so Max and Jin Yang and I uh, collaborated on a number of programs while I was a grad student. And we continue to work together. Um, we'll be telling you a little bit today about um, some future observations that we'll be using uh, Hubble to make um, that will allow us actually a chance to look for satellites of Ceres and to get ready for the close approach and, and orbit insertion into Ceres for the Dawn mission. So even though uh, we've already passed Vesta, we're still using uh, data and a collaboration with Hubble Space Telescope to make science of small bodies and Dawn science possible. And so that's kind of what we wanted to share with you today is the history of the collaboration between uh, Space Telescope and Hubble Space Telescope and then uh, the Dawn mission in order to understand these uh, really interesting objects in the solar system. Um, so that's why we've, uh, we've got this panel here today. Um, because that's still going on. Um, a lot of the time I think we get really caught up in we need higher resolution pictures, we need better pictures, and we need uh, new, new, new. And it's amazing what we can still do with the tools that we sent up into space you know, a decade ago or more um, using still uh, uh, instruments on Hubble and um, collaborating between these missions. So. I'm really excited to, to share with you guys that and to um, let uh, Max and Jin Yang, who've been doing a lot of that work as well, um, get a chance to share that with you as well. Yeah, so we started off with the uh, banner graphic you guys made for this Hangout, which shows uh, these two different views of, of Vesta. 
So uh, these high-resolution images of Vesta that we got from D the Dawn spacecraft, but also the Hubble images that helped inform the science before Dawn got there. Maybe you guys can uh, start off by telling us a little bit about the kind of work that goes into making these images with the Hubble Space Telescope and, and what they show. Yeah, well, uh, John Yang really uh, led the, the mapping effort. Um, maybe I could talk a little bit about the raw images you know, that we take with Hubble and the steps that I go through to uh, you know, clean them up and make them the you know the highest resolution images we can possibly make, and uh, I can just screen share sure. for a second here to give you a sense of what the raw Hubble data looks like um, when it comes down. Uh, let me just pull something up here. Um, mm. All right, so what I'm showing right here, can you see that these blue? Uh, is everybody seeing that? All right, so what you see there on the left, it looks like a pile of blue Legos, basically. Um, that's actually what Vesta looks like in, uh, at the time, I guess we were using the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2. You'll hear us talk about a couple of different Hubble cameras, um, partly because new cameras have been installed in Hubble, but also because sometimes uh, we've had one fail, and then we have to go back to using an older one, and so throughout this whole story, we're using both the, the rather old wide field um, planetary camera 2, which was installed in 1993 by astronauts. Then there's the advanced camera for surveys that was installed in 2002. And now we have uh, that camera repaired plus the new wide field camera 3 that was installed in 2009. So you'll hear us keep using you know, those terms for the cameras. And, uh, and we've used them all from time to time. So what we're looking at here is uh, on the left, you know, again, that pile of blue Legos is what Vesta looks like, um, and you think, well, gee, I've seen a lot of really amazing Hubble images, and that doesn't look so amazing. It, it looks pretty low resolution, and and uh, it is. It's because Vesta is quite small, even though it's really close by compared to a lot of the things we look at with Hubble. It's it's quite small, and you can see individual pixels there, and so. But with kind of clever observing strategy, um, we've actually used a couple different observing strategies, like. Um, where we shift the telescope around and take a lot of exposures by you know, shifting the target around and sampling the image. Um, we're able to combine them into the, the ones you see to the right there are ones where, in this case, where we've actually used our knowledge of the telescope optics, what we call the point spread function, to um, resample the image intelligently and try to enhance any features that are there. So you can see it starts to look less like a pile of Legos and a little bit more like an interesting world in the solar system. You see some features there that um, in the next step, uh, John Yang Li will describe you know, his, his process of turning that into a, a very detailed map of the sur surface of Vesta. John Yang? Yes. <clears throat> so, okay, after uh, Max did the uh, fantastic job for the first step of the processing, uh, what we do is that we try to make this small round dot, or maybe not dot, small round disk, and we take a lot of them at uh, when Vesta related to us, or facing us with different uh, uh, different sides, and then we put them all together and uh, we try to uh, you know unwrap them to uh, to uh, you know just like we make a map, make a map of the Earth, we make ma make a map you know just put all of them together and make a map of Vesta, and okay so. Um, so um, Max actually is showing the uh, a lot of uh, you know these images taken for taken uh, of the um, uh, the different sides of Vesta, and then that's the, the those images that we used in order to make the format. Yeah, I was showing one example there, and, and now I'm showing like you know we took a whole bunch of images obviously to capture Vesta rotating in this case. Okay, why are they blue? <laughs> That's just sort of arbitrary. Um, okay. We actually took images in several filters um, so that we could make a color movie, mm -hmm. and I can show that in a second. And in addition to the maps that John Yang made, you know, we made a kind of a crude little movie. I actually, um, in a way, there's no color here. I mean, this is just sort of a color I applied because I find it easier on my eyes to look at than just, say, a grayscale image. Um, in fact, um, you know, we in fact we took images of three different filters. This one happens to be one that's kind of close to the UV, I guess, um, ultraviolet light. Um, but the blue is sort of irrelevant. It's just uh, sort of a helpful aid in in uh, 
in our tools, we can apply any, any color to images like this. And, and I'm often like choosing a color not based on what color the object actually is, but on what allows my eye to see the most detail. Very cool. Right, yeah. Um, Nicole, if you can keep those uh, the images that Max showed on the screen for a while, I can just uh, uh, talk about a little bit feature okay. on those disks, and then so we'll know um, if uh, we'll talk about some a little more details about what we're doing to take those images to uh, take those images and transfer them transfer them to Max. So if you look at those images carefully, uh, these images actually um, show you some features on Vesta, some, some light, some, you know, if you start from the maybe third image uh, in the second row, there are a bright patch, and then if you go along that row and you will see the bright patch actually moves, that actually shows that the rotation of Vesta. And then what we did is that we take this, uh, this uh, disk and we, um, we apply some kind of corrections by correction, I mean, you know, over here you see the center of disk appears to be brighter generally than the, the, the edge of disk. So we apply some kind of correction to take it out, and then we 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 um, we unwrap it to a flat surface and project it to a um, to a map. And then this one of these image will give us one patch on the map. And then we just uh, uh, take all these rotating Im uh, all these disks, uh, all these patches, and put them on the map. And then one by one um, at their correct location, and then that way we can make a nice map at, at, at the end. Do you want to show the color map of Vesta? Oh, sorry, series. I have a color map of series. Do you want to switch to that? Yeah, let me uh, try to pull that up here. Oh, okay. You guys can talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Jin Yang, I, I know. So if you if you thought about um if if someone wants to actually show that graphic again, um the the graphic that we put out for the hangout um sure I'll get that if up. You look at it. Um, the reason that we put this graphic together was really to show how complementary these data sets are. So now that you've seen um images of Vesta from Hubble. Now kind of what we're going to do is we're going to show you the map of Vesta from, from Hubble and how it relates to what we actually were able to get on the Dawn team. So um, Jin Yang is one of, the, one of the investigators. He's a participating scientist on the Dawn mission, which means that he joined the mission as a scientist after it launched. Um, you get a chance to apply um, for an additional grant to join the mission um, to add to the science team. So Jun Yang is one of the people um, that's actually joined as a participating scientist. And so what this graphic is really showing you is that that's a map, just like he's just described, of Vesta using those same images that you just saw Max show you. So you take each of those individual images and add it up. So Jun Yang, did you want to kind of describe what this is showing here in terms of the data from Hubble and the data from Vesta, or um, from Dawn? Sure, yeah. So what, are, what, what you are seeing here is actually uh, the topography map. Um, by that, we mean this map tells us how high, you know, what's the, what's the um, altitude of each point in the map on Vesta. And uh, the whole banner is actually made, uh, made out of uh, HST and Hubble images. I mean, the, the, the background banner, the, uh, the, the low resolution map. And then there's a blowout uh, at the center where um, in Hubble map, it, 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 it's, uh, it's the highest point. And then the, in the blowout, you can see the details. And this part is actually the topography we uh, derived from the dawn, <coughs> dawn images. And over here, you can see the, 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 uh, you can see a lot more details than what when than what you can see in the in the Hubble map. But if you compare the overall um, agreement, I mean, if you compare these two parts, you can see that they overall agree with each other very well. I would say the agreement is excellent. Um, Considering Hubble has a, considering the resolution of Hubble images, it's about, let's see, um, 40 kilometers per pixel. And then for Dawn images, these images are um, like um, 50 meters per pixel. You can see that what, what kind of excellent job that Hubble images have, 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 Hubble images have done in order you know, for us to, 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 to see what the surface is like despite it's relatively much lower resolution than Hubble, than, than DAW images. So I think that's very, um, uh, that, that's exciting. Yeah, I thought it was really amazing that when we got the data back from Vesta, just how well it matched up. It really shows kind of that proof of concept that 
that the Hubble cameras are really pretty excellent and, and really demonstrate what you can do even from far away. Um, we do that in a number of ways in astronomy. We use um, ground-based telescopes with a variety of different resolution to compare to spacecraft data. Um, there's other examples too of how um, smaller ground-based telescopes have been used to do stuff like track the phase behavior. So um, if you if you think about the um, the full moon, right? It rotates in a full, it gets super bright. Um, that's actually the phase behavior of the moon. It's actually telling you about the particulates on the moon's surface. So we did a similar survey um, using both ground-based te uh, telescopes and some Hubble data to try to understand the brightness function or the, the phase behavior um, of VESTA. And that's something that you also participated in, right, Jin Yang? Um, yes, that's right. <clears throat> So it's just another way of using um, a bunch of different data sets. Uh, we don't. Uh, we always need a spacecraft to at least confirm and to tell us new things. If you, you know, we, we couldn't see the little small craters. We couldn't see the detail. We couldn't see that uh, Rhea Silvia was two basins, but we could see that Rhea Silvia was there, and that's what we're hoping to be able to do when we actually get to Ceres. So, um, Max, did you have your uh, your um, Ceres data up or? I'm sorry, it keeps failing on me. Like I don't know uh, why, but um, I'll keep trying. But um, I do have the one for series when we get to series. Can Can you guys maybe talk about some of the science that um, Hubble that you were able to figure out from the Hubble images, and then how that was furthered by the the Dawn mission, the Dawn images of Vesta? Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, when we when we um, when we take the images of Vesta using Hubble telescope. We actually took the images at, at several different colors, and then um, by comparing the images at different colors, we were able to figure out what are I know what are the um, what are on the surface and what kind of uh, change when we move from one place to, to another on, on the surface faster. And uh, that's that you know that technique is called color ratioing. We are just taking the ratio of different color di different images at different wavelengths, different colors. And um, so we actually um, generated maps from um, just like we, what we did for a series. We generated that, that the maps for Vesta, and um, um, the re again the resolution of that maps is those maps are kind of low, but uh, but then we uh, actually we um, we we learned that one side of Vesta is kind of uh, you know um, dark, and the other side is kind of bright, and then the dark side we figure that is um, mostly like. Um, rich in one kind of minerals called eucrite, and the other side, which uh, the, the bright side is, um, um, you know, more has more min more minerals called the diogenite. So these those two th those those are the different minerals we can see from Hubble images, and also we can see a lot of uh, you know from from one area to another area we can see different compositions in it, and when Dawn gets there and uh, you know my colleagues, Vision Ready and uh, and others. They actually did very um, detailed comparison of the maps, um, similarly generated but using Dawn data with the uh, maps generated with Hubble data. And uh, what they say is that you can actually find all kinds of uh, you know for, for the features you see in Hubble Hubble maps, you can find the corresponding features in Dawn maps. So that's an excellent matching match. And then, but on the other hand, because Dawn has a much higher resolution, that gives us a lot more information about what we cannot we cannot learn from Hubble images. Um, you know, for example, um, I can give you one example, which is uh, one area we call that um, Macho region. That region is, uh, um, I think, a lot of uh, um, people may uh, may might be able to uh, recognize it. That is, uh, that region has like three big craters forming a kind of a snowman. The snowman, shape. yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So um, you know, from Hubble, we just saw there's uh, probably a dark blob over there, and we, we thought that area is kind of interesting. It has uh, might have uh, um, a lot of eucrite, and uh, it might be old. But then when Don gets there from the, those images, looking at the Snowman region images, what we learn is actually those three craters are kind of young, and uh, the surface is is dark on one side and uh, not that dark on the other other half, and then. Um, also, there's a lot of interesting things going on on the bottom of the Macho crater, the bigger, the, the largest crater of the Snowman craters, and uh, there are some interesting features over there, such as you know the um, you know um, possibly outgassing, not out, possibly the um, um, possible phenomena related to volatiles at the bottom of the crater. So basically, they saw a lot of uh, featureless, um, um, rimless pits at the bottom of the crater. 
we're still in the process in the process of understand fully understanding this region. But you know, Hubble just uh, 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 down data just advanced our knowledge a lot. Um, that's what Hubble now could not have done. Yeah, and I can't uh, I can't reiterate enough how uh, gratifying it was to see that paper mm -hmm. by Vishnu Reddy that John Yang just talked about. You know, verifying that you know the observations we did with Hubble were valid. You know, and that the crude features we saw at low resolution with Hubble were actually were actually there because um, you know any any astronomer knows this that you know you can you see that we're kind of working the data really hard. You know, we have that pile of Legos at the beginning, and then we're we're massaging it, and we're 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 you know doing all these special tricks to try to bring out all these features. And the concern is always that you're manufacturing features that aren't really there. You know that you're you're torturing the data so much until until you get something that isn't really real in the image. And uh, you like to have that verification that yes, these things really are real because uh, of course in the case of Vesta and Ceres, we we have the Dawn spacecraft arriving to verify these things for us. But of course, most of the objects in the solar system will never have a spacecraft visit, and so we need to know that you know these observations we're doing with Hubble or any other tricks we're using from ground-based adaptive optics or things like that that we're we're actually getting real results. We're we're observing real features even at low resolution, and so uh, it was very heartening to to hear that. Yeah, so that image is actually showing the the feature that um, that they were just talking about. I had I had to show this. <laughs> yeah, the this, this snowman craters. So uh, it, I mean, it's appropriate for the for the holidays. Holidays. Right? Um, so that that region is the area that in the dawn uh, or then in the Hubble images were kind of this big dark this big dark feature. And originally, it was kind of misinterpreted as a single big splotch, and it turns out to be much more detailed and much more uh, complex than that. And there's some really interesting geology that it turns out. So we could actually see the feature. We knew something was interesting there with the Hubble data. And then when we went back, it was just even more interesting than we ever could have could have imagined and, and was uh, especially photogenic, shall we say. Yes, yes. So there, there's your greeting card that you guys can use. Uh, <laughs> straight for, it looks like it, it came from Joe Wise, actually. So it came from the, <laughs> the Don EPO team. Very cool. Well, of course, we'd be remiss if we don't talk about the really big impact crater on Vesta as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, earlier observations, we're talking about some of the more recent observations of Vesta. You know, earlier observations of Vesta with Hubble, you know, the, one of the most obvious things you see is, is this, uh, well, it's not round. And it, it probably was round at one point, but it obviously endured a massive impact, which amazingly didn't disrupt the whole asteroid, you know, because it looks like an enormous uh, impact crater that's like, you know, more than half the diameter of the whole planet uh, or protoplanet. And, uh, um, and that sort of fit with a lot of other things we knew about Vesta and Vestoid asteroids and things like that. And it obviously it tells you a lot about the you know the geology and of Vesta. So that was another early contribution from Hubble in terms of understanding you know the morphology of Vesta. Yeah. So so let's um, talk a little bit about what we're going to do for Ceres or what already has been done for Ceres, and then what what's kind of still left to be done and what, what, what we can kind of guess about Ceres using, using the Hubble data. So um, one of the, so here you go, this is a, this is a great picture. So this is a, a picture of those two largest asteroids of Ceres and are, I guess, the second, or the first and third largest asteroids, because it's missing one. Um, we're missing another one that the three of us actually work together called Pallas, which is the object that is a lot like Ceres, but is about the same size as Vesta. Um, so um, that kind of completes that uh, completes that set. But that image right there um, is showing you um, some of the information that we got from uh, from Hubble for Ceres. And I, I got really excited. So when I was uh, an, an undergraduate looking for graduate programs, I really desperately wanted to work on Europa. And uh, at the end of the Galileo mission, not a lot of people were looking to fund uh, new students. Um, funding for icy planets was going away, and so they weren't really looking for new students to study Europa. And so um, when I applied to UCLA, I actually got an, e an email from Chris Russell, who's the PI of the Dawn mission and ended up being my thesis advisor. And what he did is to actually send me um, that paper, the paper, the very first paper about the first uh, Hubble data of Ceres, and then um, a paper along with it that was just in production, uh, interpreting not only the shape, but what could the interior be like of Ceres. So it was the very first paper that really suggested in a big way 
that Ceres is probably icy. Um, and it was Hubble that gave us that. It was that very first picture that you just showed um, in 2004 of Ceres um, that showed us just how round it was, just how big it was, and just how different from every other asteroid out there it really could be. Um, and so that was really exciting for me, and that ended up being a big career changer, getting these papers about an icy, you know, an, an ice ball uh, sitting there in the middle of the asteroid belt that we might be able to go to with the spacecraft was a an absolute. Um, uh, it was an absolute. It was a huge career changer for me. So that's what I ended up working on was was uh, big asteroids instead of what I had planned on. Uh, I planned on working. So Hubble has done a lot for me, and it's done a lot for a lot of for a lot of scientists in terms of what it could tell us about Ceres. So um, Jin Yang, uh, um, sorry, Max, you actually worked on that data set, correct? Yeah, there's kind of an interesting story there. I mean, I think I had been helping with the Vesta data, and I recall a telecon. This would have been like, I was actually just going through my emails um, just before this Hangout, just to remind myself the sequence of events. And it was a pretty cool summer in 2006, if you think about it, because the whole vote, you know, the IEU vote on, on what is a planet, what is a dwarf planet was going on. and I didn't quite see it coming that Ceres was going to be like such a central figure in that whole debate because here we are having a telecon in, in May and we're kind of talking about the Vesta data and then talking about the, the Ceres data and it was in that phone call that I realized um, that John Yang had been working with, there was sort of two, two types of data, there was sort of uh, some dithered data and some undithered data and I think he had been working with the undithered data and the dithering, when I say dither, that's these small telescope shifts, you know, pointing shifts we do with the telescope. And I, I'm, you know, an expert on dealing with data like that. And I realized that we had the best data of series ever, you know, the highest resolution images, but it was going to take some effort to stitch it together into that image that you now see everywhere. You know, if you go to Wikipedia and mm -hmm. look up series, there it is. And uh, so I realized I kind of made a mental note of that in that telecon that, oh, wow, you know, that's, we're sitting on the best image of series ever. We got to, you know, we got to really you know, work on this data and, and put that out. But then I kind of didn't do anything about it for a couple of months um, until August rolls around, and the IEU is, is voting on what is and isn't a planet, right, and a dwarf planet. And in the first, um, if you remember that history, in the first proposal that was put forward was very inclusive. It was not only going to include Pluto as a planet, but it was going to include Ceres as a planet. Yeah. So now here we have Ceres, which originally was designated as a planet back in the early 1800s when it was discovered. Then it got demoted to, to asteroid for the last, you know, 150 years. And now it's about to have its debut as a planet again. <laughs> and, and, and we're sitting on the best data. That, you know, the, the world has not seen yet the best image of Ceres yet. And so that really kicked me into gear um, to go get that data out of the archive and do what I do, which is... Um, Again, if you look at the raw data, it looks a little bit like a Lego pile and uh, applying actually a different technique. Um, the first one I mentioned with Vesta was called deconvolution, where we're using the, the telescope point, point spread function to try to enhance the image. And in this case, it's different. We're taking images that were shifted slightly and then combining them and, and highly resampling them to try to extract as much spatial information as possible. And then there were, again, multiple filters so we could make a color image. And it's very challenging because not only because you're starting with the pile of Legos, but because Ceres is rotating. You know, between each frame, it's moving and rotating. And um, so I'll just sc uh, sc start screen sharing here. Um, Actually, oops. while you're doing that, we have a question that I think dovetails off of this uh, from okay. Ron Mater. Uh, he says, "Nerdy question: Are there any lessons learned that help that help make current data sets available for future research? It sounds like this archival data was really important." Um, are there any lessons learned or, or things in general about this data being available that you can comment on? Yeah, there sure are. I mean, we archive all of our data, and so the Hubble mission, you know, we're well into our 23rd year, and <laughs> wow. there's, a ton, there's a ton of data in there, and obviously Hubble's a general observatory, so only some fraction of it is planetary data, but um, we, it's archived and publicly available. Like we have a proprietary period for new data. So for the first year, it's only the science team that can work on it. So they can do a careful analysis and publish a paper. But after that year, it's anybody's game. And uh, so we have been encouraging people to, you know, consider it. Even high school kids, undergrads, uh, amateur astronomers. 
I got to warn you, though, it's real data. You know, it's not nice, pretty press release pictures. Um, but there are a lot of amateur astronomers and, and certainly high school students and who could do like a science fair project or college students or grad students who could do, you know, uh, thesis type work. Um, and we support that kind of archival research as well as new observations with Hubble. So, so the image I'm showing you was actually publicly available at the time that we had that telecon in the summer of 2006. In principle, anybody could have gotten it out of the archive and, and done what I, what I did to, to you know, enhance the image and, and produce the image um, that you see there. And uh, so I'm actually going to go through a series, just kind of blink through a series of images here. Um, you can kind of see series rotating because there was a you know, fair number of images taken over um, uh, as you can see, the dates and the hours rolling by there, you know, different faces of series um, that allow us to see different features. And I just have to say that, you know, not only was series about to become a planet, um, but just looking at these images, just you just have such a visceral reaction that this is not like some lifeless hunk of iron tumbling through the asteroid belt. You know, this is this is when I would give talks and show this, I would say, if I told you this was Mars, you'd, you'd believe me, you know? It looks like a planet. And, uh, and uh, you know, it just, it's round. It meets the roundness criteria of a dwarf planet. But you also see features rotating in and out of view. And, um, you know, it just looks like a real world to me. It doesn't, you know, it's, it, it kind of uh, uh, challenges your kind of Star Wars movie mentality of what an asteroid is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And really makes you realize that this is at least a dwarf planet, if not a planet, and why it's in league with Pluto and, uh, and really a fascinating world in the, in the solar system. And, it, and as Brittany was saying, one that's much, much closer to us than Pluto and Europa, and so you know, possibly much more accessible. But we did, so we did release this image on the same day that the IAU vote ended. And obviously, as, as you know, like both Pluto and Ceres ended up as dwarf planets, uh, not planets, but nonetheless, it was still promoted from asteroid to dwarf planet, and so I was very proud that we were able to put out the best ever image of it um, on the day that it became a dwarf planet, and all the while knowing that um, its days were numbered because when dawn arrives, you know, this image is going to look very quaint. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a couple of comments. Um, one amusing comment from Hugo Burnham and and uh, Tony, which he he says he he ripped off this catchphrase from Tony Darnell. The Hubble huggers inspire the dawn darlings. So <laughs> heard that one yet? I like it. <laughs> awesome. Um, and then writing with robots asks, what specific things seen in the Hubble data on Ceres? Maybe we can transition to that. Um, are you most excited about checking checking out up close with dawn? Oh man, well if you take a look at that, you can see that unlike Vesta, you there's no big giant impact basin. There's almost nothing. So one of the things that, that I've been doing on, on uh, telescope data is to look at how you can estimate shapes and sizes and topography. And this is, the, the best resolution on here is about 20 kilometers or so. Which means that Ceres doesn't have any topography down to about 25 to 50 to 50 uh, kilometers, which is really, really flat uh, by anyone's standards. And that's really exciting because the places that we see that have that kind of flat topography are in fact made of ice. Um, however, you'll notice there's not a whole lot on the surface. There's not big, huge, dark splotches. There's not. There are a few few spots. The the thing that um, I'm sure Jin Yang is going to show in a minute is that those change and go away depending on the wavelength. So whereas in on Vesta, once we saw a dark region, it was pretty much there in a lot of area in in a lot of different wavelength regions. Um, it's not true um, on Ceres. It Ceres looks different in the UV. It looks different in the visible. It looks different in the IR. Um, so we don't really have a good idea of what a lot of those features might mean. There's lots of speculation, but this is one of the places where resolution and having high resolution spectroscopy and high resolution resolution images is really going to help us understand what it is that we're actually looking at. So it might be a good transition um, if we want to show the, the map and then maybe Jin Yang you could talk a little bit about the surface of Ceres. Yeah, sure. Sure, you want me to show uh, the Ceres maps? Yeah, the Ceres map. Yes. 
Yeah, slowly get that up. Putting, uh, putting that up um, I want to point out that actually for serious images, that was taken by a different camera than what we used for, for Vesta. That camera was uh, the uh, was a high, well, has has a higher resolution than the camera we use for for Vesta. So, but yeah. that camera, unfortunately, that camera is gone now. It's it's dead. <laughs> so we hope we we wish it can last longer. But yeah, yeah. that okay, was a so, that was an unfortunate summer. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, we originally originally planned to use that camera for for Vesta, right? I still remember that. But then. Uh, but anyway, okay. So um, what do you what you are seeing now is the map of Sirius, uh, just at um, you know using the images that uh, Max just showed us um, to make to 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 make. And uh, um, if you still remember what Max showed, there are some little blobs on the surface of Sirius, and then rotate across the across the disk. And if you look at this map, you can actually find all those features here. And as I, as I said, for, for, for what we did for Vesta, um, we did the similar, very similar thing for Sirius here. We, um, we, we, we took out, we, we, uh, took, uh, took out some uh, photomagic, photomagic um, um, you know, uh, effects from the center to limb, and then we unwrap them, and we project them on this kind of um, um, uh, lunch to latitude coordinate, and um, put them all together. And uh, what's shown here are actually three maps. Um, they are take. They are actually um, at. Uh, they are the maps that you see at, uh, through different. Uh, I can say through 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 different color filters or maybe color different color glasses. Um, the first one is uh, green light. So if you put on a green glass and you look at Sirius, that's what map you are. You, you, that's that's the map you see. And then the middle one is a uh, um, purple color, and then the last one, the bottom one, is actually uh, in a UV. So if you put a glass that does not block UV light but block visible light and let uh, UV light go through, that's what you see uh, about Sirius. Of course, we do not we do not see UV light. <laughs> um, so um, I want to point out uh, there are two things here I want to talk about. One is that you do see a lot of features on it. Um, you know, on the top panel you can see we we actually put in a se several a lot of circles over here that tells you what are the what where these features are. And we also number them in order to just uh, talk about it. But I'm not going to go through all of them. But I just want to point out that um, um, you know these features, the some of uh, some of them are brighter than uh, others. Some of them are darker. And uh, um, oh, the, I should I should say the color are actually not real. These colors we just use these colors to tell you how bright how bright they are and how dark they are. And there's a color banner at the bottom of this figure. So. Um, <clears throat> So one thing is that you can see all these figures, but then um, when we look at how bright these bright features are compared to other compared to dark features, we found that just like Brittany just said, um, the the change is very very small. It's very subtle. Um, so if you if you um, compare to the moon, you know the moon, um, the, the the bright highlands. We all know the highlands are brighter than the mare, and then the highlands are actually almost twice as bright as mare. And then for Vesta, it's about um, um, it's um, like the, the bright area is about maybe uh, 50 percent uh, brighter than the dark area. But then for Sirius, it's much 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 smaller than that. It's only about like 10 percent. So uh, if we actually, if we can if we really use our eyes to look at look at Sirius, and I would say we probably were not able to tell this difference, tell the difference in brightness of these features, and. Uh, the reason that you can see those features in the image that Max showed is just because, just because we enhanced it. We enhanced the contrast in order to see those features. But in reality, these features uh, these features are just so mild. Um, so, um, so what are these features? I mean, if you if you if you compare the uh, maps at different colors, you can see that they are almost totally different. You know, some features like number nine or number ten. I don't know whether you can tell you can see these numbers. They appear to be darker. Yes, thank you, Nicole. <laughs> they appear to be dark in the in the visible. I mean, green light. But if you move to the UV light, the bottom one, looks like they getting they are getting brighter. So that's very interesting. Um, we do not know what these features are, what these the compositions are yet. That's because we just know we just um, we just know too few too little about what the composition series is. And that's something that we hope Don will help us to resolve. So, 
Yeah, that's one of the big enigmas for a series is that um, it just doesn't doesn't seem to behave right in so many ways, right? So it's it's big and round. It's super flat. The spots don't stay in the same place. I mean, they 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 don't stay there in every wavelength. So um, you know, it's easy if you think it's uh, you know if you think you've maybe got a crater, you would normally see it in the topography. You'd see it in uh, in surface materials, you'd, you'd see an indication of it. It's really hard to get a handle on, on what's going on at Ceres. So, um, and this is true not just for Ceres, but also for other asteroids like it. Um, so Pallas is a little bit like this, Themis is a little bit like this, Hygieia is a little bit like this. They're these kind of big, dark, relatively flat spectra, relatively um, nondescript um, observations that we have so far. So one of the cool things, at least for me, is that we think of Ceres as kind of the uh, um, maybe the gateway to this other class of objects. It's the first time we'll get up close enough to be able to understand what it is that these data sets that seem to be telling us one thing on one side and one thing on the other side um, really mean. And then we might be able to actually take that and expand it to other asteroids that are similar um, and actually be able to make comparison sets. So that was um, you know, that was actually what my thesis was about, was using um, the same camera, as it turned out, that, that Jin Yang, um, that we used uh, for Vesta, uh, we ended up using for Pallas, which is the second largest asteroid that's kind of, a, it's kind of like half between uh, Vesta and Ceres in a lot of ways, um, and trying to make that full comparison set of these largest objects. But there are fully four or five other objects that are very much large, important asteroids in the asteroid belt for which we don't even have Hubble data yet, really, not any really good stuff. So we keep putting in these proposals and hoping to get some time. So hopefully we'll actually get to get a data set like that um, for these other asteroids, especially once we know what we're looking at with Ceres. be really exciting. So um, We have some questions about the smoothness, actually. Um, it, it, Tiago Bonito is asking, does it mean it could have a young surface? Uh, and Writing with Robots asks if the smoothness hints at a place that is Europa-like or Enceladus-like. Are you willing to speculate on that? Yeah, so actually what, what we think, um, it's unlikely to be Europa or Enceladus-like. So Europa and Enceladus are both objects that um, have influence of tides all the time, so the tides really help them out. Mm -hmm. They're also, um, Enceladus is much less dense, so actually um, Enceladus is kind of a weird one. So if you move Enceladus to the asteroid belt, it actually turns out to only be about the fourth or fifth largest asteroid. So it's actually l less than half the size of Ceres. So, and that's just an extent. So Ceres is massive compared to Enceladus um, and not quite as big as Europa. Um, so Europa is about twice or uh, about three times as big as Ceres is and way bigger, way bigger than Enceladus. Um, but Enceladus is, has a density of about 1,600 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, Europa has a density of about 3,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And uh, Ceres has about 2,000 kilograms per meter cubed, which is actually really close, uh, a lot closer to, Gant or to Callisto. Um, because Ceres doesn't have a ton of tidal input, we're not quite sure if there's enough energy to continue to keep the interior warm or to fully differentiate the planet. However, um, it gets a lot of energy from the sun, so depending on how efficient it is at using some of this energy and how fast it formed, um, that'll really tell us what the interior is like. So I think the interior on Ceres is less likely to be active than it is, for instance, on Europa. Um, but it has a lot more radiogenic material, for instance, than Enceladus would. So it's maybe a little bit more like that. But if you think about Callisto, which is bigger than Ceres, but it's actually uh, an object that is partially differentiated, um, and it probably has an ocean layer. Um, but if you think about its surface, it's, it's kind of an older surface. So we're thinking that it may be somewhere between those two. The interesting thing about it is that because Ceres is so much closer to the sun, um, water ice isn't actually stable on its surface. So the water has to be buried, which means that there's a lot of heating and a lot of dynamics that might happen because of that heat. So it's very, it's very possible that it could be a relatively young surface, but it would be a different process than on Europa, where we think it might be coming from the interior, whereas on Ceres it may be working its way from the top down. Um, certainly, originally, we think Ceres had a, had a, probably had a water, 
uh, a big water layer. Whether it's still there or not, unfortunately, we won't be able to know. Um, but we'll have some indications of what might be going on. So it's a real possibility since we don't see any topography. So if you look at the topography of the icy satellites, they're very smooth. They're kind of cue ball-like. Um, and at this resolution, they would look very similar, um, at least in terms of topography. And that's because ice, when it's relatively warm, um, uh, relatively, you know, being uh, <laughs> an interesting word, so even at 150 Kelvin, right, um, it actually can flow. Um, so that's why glaciers work like that, all of that. So ice flows a lot faster than rock, so it can actually kind of erase some of that signature of topography. So you could have a surface riddled with craters that we can't see because the craters have become really flat. Mm -hmm. They've relaxed out and they've kind of uh, become flatter. The ice has reprocessed it. If it turns out to be icy, which we think it probably will be, um, but there's, there's a possibility that it's an old surface that's kind of just rebounded, or there's a, definitely the possibility that all of that extra energy from the sun and kind of a, a vigorous early period may combine uh, to make Ceres a, a younger surface. So it'll be really cool to, to go and find that out. Yeah, uh, Sylvan Westby also asks, uh, I know you, uh, Zhang Yang, you said we're not sure of the composition of some of these areas, but do you guys have any guesses about the composition of the surface of Ceres from the data that we have so far and how it might be different from Vesta? Uh, particularly asking about those white spots. <laughs> well, um, since we we don't we do not really know the exact composition of the surface, we do not really know what are those bright spots. Um, mm. Well, I should say that we actually we have we have uh, we have a number of explanations for what are they. I mean, for, for what are on the surface of Sirius from the spectrum. Um, the spectrum of Sirius is kind of um, uh, is kind of flat and uh, kind of featureless, but there are some complex, very complex feature in the three micron band, three micron wavelength band. And that band has been studied for like 20, 30 years, I think. But then people still don't understand what it is. <laughs> um, we, you know, people propose that there are several, there are many, many, there are like a number of different uh, possibilities. Um, there's just no conclusion yet. But um, one interesting thing about all these possibilities is that um, all these possibilities, possibilities, possible minerals require a, a water-based Origin. So that means, you know, it's very possible that water could be very close to the surface of Sirius in history. But That's what I'm pulling for. I'm pulling for those white spots being ice geysers. And <laughs> in, my, in my, you know, fantasy scenario, as dawn goes into orbit, not only does it verify that it's ice, but there's actually like fish flipping around on the surface. <laughs> and then you can just clear the space for your Nobel Prize, you know, on your show. You heard it here first, Hangout viewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that's. Well, yeah, unfortunately, those bright spots are only slightly brighter than the background. So oh, that makes it hard. Yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we have a question um, from Michael Jobin uh, asking if there, uh, and I know this was something we, we wanted to talk uh, touch on as well. Is there a moon or satellite hazard for dawn? And I know that there is uh, some effort going into looking for satellites around uh, uh, around these objects. Maybe you guys can touch on that a bit. Yeah. So with Hubble, we've conducted moon searches uh, for both Vesta and Ceres. Um, several attempts. Obviously, we failed, or that would be like the headline of today's Hangout, right? Um, so I think we were especially disappointed with Vesta because, you know, with that big impact crater, you just think there must something must have gone into orbit around Vesta, and I, I really thought we were going to discover a moon of Vesta. And then we also used the Dawn spacecraft itself, of course, as it went into orbit in July of 2011, you know, using the framing camera, and, and obviously did not discover anything. And so now here we here comes Ceres, and we you know we've had some telecons lately talking about how to use the Dawn spacecraft, and we will. And there's a nice plan, you know, coming together. But in that telecon, it reminded me that we should really try with Hubble again because um, I'm going to screen share just quickly the last moon search attempt. Um, you know, using again, we were forced to use the old wide field planetary camera too, a camera from 1993. You know, and we obviously have a camera that was installed in 2009, two generations better camera. And so here's a here's one of the shots from the moon search back in 2009 using WIFPIC2. And so it's an intentionally overexposed image of Ceres down there at lower right, looking like a bright star. So Ceres is all washed out, so we can take a deep exposure of the area around it. And you see a lot of cosmic rays and artifacts like diffraction spikes and saturation and I'm going to click to a cleaner frame so I, you know, I can clean out the cosmic rays and things like that. 
And then the next frame, I kind of flatten the image to uh, suppress the brightness of, of series itself so we could search. And you see a lot of blips around there, but we know that they're just like residual artifacts from the camera and cosmic rays. Obviously, we didn't discover anything. But we did the, you know, a fair amount of that. And unfortunately, we, you know, we didn't find anything. Um, but in, the, in our discussions last spring with uh, you know, how to utilize the Dawn spacecraft, um, we realized we should submit another Hubble proposal to use the newer camera, the Wide Field Camera 3, which is a much better camera and give us one final chance next spring to uh, try to pull a rabbit out of our hat. And obviously we'll have another hangout if that happens. Yes, we'll schedule an emergency hangout. <laughs> that would be super big news. I would love that. Yeah. Uh, Star Trek fans, that, that the name of that program he's showing is DS9. It is named after the DS9 you're thinking of. <laughs> Astronomers are nerds, so we'll go with that. I <laughs> so have it sounds like you're, you're not worried about it being the moons being a hazard. It's more of like, ooh, that would be really interesting scientifically. Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, in principle... Yeah, I mean, the, even if there was a moon or two, it's unlikely that the spacecraft would slam right into it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've done similar searches for uh, Pluto, and it, it was considered a possible hazard, not because of the moons themselves, but because of, you know, for very small bodies, they have almost no escape velocity. You know, you stomp, you know, a small micrometeorite impact could send dust into orbit around Ceres, and so it would probably be the, the, the dust particles that it might... Um, spray into the region around Ceres, that would be more of a threat. But, um, you know, obviously in the absence of any moons, there's no possibility of that. So, um, but certainly it was a concern for the New Horizons spacecraft uh, at Pluto because, but of course we, are, we know of um, five moons of Pluto, and at the moment we know of zero moons of Ceres, so obviously less of a concern. <laughs> You're being very modest. I believe you discovered two of those moons, so... <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I played a similar role for the New Horizons team, and we, you know, we over the last uh, since 2005 have discovered four moons of Pluto. Yeah. Uh, with Hubble, that and I was hoping to do the same thing for the Dawn mission. <laughs> we still have one more chance, right, Brittany? Right, John? Yep, exactly. Uh, so we have a couple questions about Dawn itself. Uh, Tony Darnell is asking, can we talk a little bit about where Dawn is now on its way to Ceres? Um, and also, uh, Hugo's asking, how long does Dawn have, um, whether Dawn has its thrusters on while it's on its way to series? Um, yeah, so, well, Dawn is, <laughs> Dawn is flying away. Um, we've actually got a, I don't know, do we still have that up? I, I think we still have a, a way to track Dawn uh, online. I was going to see oh. if we could find that. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so there's a on the Dawn website. There's actually like a "Where is Dawn Now" link, so you can actually um, go on there and find out where it is. Um, and so, so yeah, we're uh, we're cruising on our way um, and looking for our, our 2015 arrival. Yeah, 2015. I think we 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 mentioned in earlier hangouts the year of the dwarf planet because we'll have New Horizons showing up at Pluto and and Charon and then uh, and Dawn showing up at Ceres. So that'll be very exciting. So I have a little uh, question. Yes. So um, in response, it's back, it's back a little bit here, but there's a response to um, talking about how um, the fact that we actually have a spacecraft that went to Vesta and they could affir affirm the data that um, Hubble had um, developed there, how does that help? with um, the Hubble Space Telescope observations of other asteroids and possibly even other um, bodies uh, in our solar system and in other solar systems. Wow, in our solar system and other solar systems. <laughs> well, I guess um, the, the, the way that uh, um, Hubble tells us is that, um, you know, the the reality check between Hubble and the Dawn, just um, the, the most important thing is that you know, now, now, we, now we know that what we, are, we have done with Hubble images are more, more likely to be correct. So in the future, we will have more confidence to do that, to do a similar thing for other asteroids. That's my understanding. Really? <laughs> you want to say something? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, another way is um, kind of like we just talked about with using um, the Hubble data to predict what we'll see at series, 
um, because there are these other asteroids out there, we may be able to use those same um, techniques that Max was mentioning uh, to be able to get a lot out of that data set and have some confidence that we know what we're talking about um, when we go there. Um, as Max mentioned, um, a lot of the really heavy lifting that we've done with um, with Hubble Space Telescope was before we even knew we were going to have Dawn, um, and then uh, you know, and, and a little bit separate from it. So. Um, what's great to do is to be able to know that when we're applying these filters and that we're working with this data set, that we're doing the right thing. And, you know, if we if we predicted that there was a big crater on Vesta, um, and then there wasn't one, <laughs> we'd have a problem. But instead, we knew that there that that it existed. We found surface variation. It'd be really cool to have another data set, especially because Ceres is is a little bit more difficult to understand. So it really is pushing the limits of what we can do with um, with those kind of pixelated things. So. And probably the perfect example is we mentioned Pallas earlier that uh, Brittany studies, studied you know, for her PhD thesis. And unfortunately, the Dawn spacecraft isn't going to get to Pallas, but certainly the, the truth you know, that we got at Vesta about it, we applied all those same techniques and everything. So it gives, gives us more confidence that you know, what we saw in, in, uh, with Hubble for Pallas is, is valid. It's you know, real features. So you guys have shared the link uh, showing us where you can you can see where Dawn is right now. I've I've added the link to the comments on the event page. Uh, it's, I can show you too. Perfect. Let's do that. Ooh, here we go. You see it? Uh, there you go. There we go. So this is uh, this is an image. So if you go on to the Dawn website, um, you'll actually be able to click on a whole range of different visualization tools. So this is a snapshot, and this is giving you the distance from Vesta, the distance to Earth, the distance to Ceres. So it's giving you exactly where Dawn is and, uh, and what it's looking at. But if you go onto that website, you can actually um, look at, you know, look in the direction of Ceres from Dawn, look in the direction of the Sun. Um, so it gives you a lot of different perspectives for, for what's been going on. That that image makes them look so close, like they're right next door. <laughs> like, why isn't it there yet? <laughs> yep. Well, series is running away from us, so we got to catch up. Okay. And apparently, YouTube comments now allow links, so I've added it on the. If you're watching on YouTube, in the comments as well, so you can go check that out for yourself. Um. So we're at the top of the hour. I want to uh, ask if there are any last questions from the audience. Anything? Any burning questions we can get to? Uh, I think there was one I wanted to mention. Um. Oh gosh. Oh, from I, Diego Benito. Being icy, is it possible that it's it's a migrant from the outer solar system? Talking about Ceres. So that's been suggested. Um, it's possible, um, but it's not required. So that's the that's the big question. We always say, oh, could this have moved in from from the outer solar system? And of, yeah, it probably could have. Um, its orbit would probably look very different. When you move something that significant a distance, at least a small object, when you scatter it in, um, the the orbits end up looking very strange. Um, that's what centaurs and comets and um, end up being. That's why they're on those very odd orbits. So Ceres is on a perfectly stable, perfectly circular orbit, right where you'd expect. You know, uh, from this observational Titius Bode law, right? You'd ex it's exactly where you'd expect another planet to be. So it's probably no accident that it's there. It probably formed there, and there's a lot of objects in the asteroid belt. You know, if Ceres was the only one that's icy, uh, that would be a, a really good question to ask. And it's a really good question anyway. But because there are so many other objects that we think now are icy asteroids, um, big icy bodies that formed in the asteroid belt, it's really changing our picture of how the solar system formed and so requiring it to come in from somewhere else is is not really not only is it probably not all that feasible depending on who you ask but um, it's not it's just not required so that's that's really exciting actually uh, Nedim Selik is asking when will we see the first pictures of series from Dawn? <laughs> 2015! 2015-ish! <laughs> we, we don't have anything more... Yeah, there's no um, you know, it, one of the things that we're doing um, is to be really, really careful about our approach. Um, so, trying to save as much, um, save as many uh, turns of the spacecraft and as many uh, and as much ion propulsion as we can. Uh, so, uh, because we had an extended mission at Vesta, 
uh, we're just trying to be, we're trying to save as much as we can for series so that maybe, uh, you know, maybe we got the chance to stay on there. So it means that, uh, that, that uh, there, isn't a, there isn't a releasable plan at this point in time. So 2015, look out for it. Okay. And we have a couple people, and I'm, pro I'm sure you probably can't quite answer this one, asking, is there an extension beyond series? Is there something for Don <laughs> to do beyond? Uh, yeah, the, well, that's that's the kind of thing that you would you would you would propose for once the once the main mission is over. Um, probably we're not leaving series. Uh, we'll probably go into a parking orbit or something like that. I, that would be my my best guess. Um, so uh, we have uh, we have reaction wheels on the spacecraft, so we're we're down to using uh, just a couple uh, a smaller set of the reaction wheels than we originally had. Um, so moving on from series probably isn't the best course of action, but um, as we've seen with Kepler, uh, right, so the new release that Kepler might be usable again uh, in a different mode, so you never know. Uh, so it's something we won't, we can't predict at this point in time. Um, one of the options is to stay longer at series, go down lower. Um, that's a really good question to ask right now because we know that planetary science is facing a huge, huge disproportionate budget cut. And so that's the kind of thing that you know. Right now, NASA is being able has to has to uh, you know might have to choose between Cassini, which still has a couple of years of existence left, and MSL, which could exist for for a long time. We may have to choose between two of our most important, biggest, greatest missions to date because we don't have enough money. So it's the kind of question we just can't ask yet. Uh, I wish I could give you an answer. Yes, we're staying at series. We're going low. You know, the, the orbital mission at Ceres is a lot shorter than it was at Vesta, even in the nominal mission, and a lot shorter, especially considering that we had an extended mission at Vesta. Um, so, man, I would love to stay at Ceres as long as we possibly could. Um, I really hope that, that things turn around and that we get, uh, we get enough funds to be able to do something like that. That would just be wonderful. Awesome. Uh, I'd like to get a uh, comment from each of the three of you to end the show. What is the thing you're most looking forward to uh, seeing at Ceres, other than fish? Because I think that <laughs> one would win uh, no matter what. But I want to, uh, first of all, thank everyone for watching this Hangout, uh, for participating, for asking questions, leaving comments. Uh, this Hangout will be available uh, recorded for you to see at any time. Uh, please do check out the NASA Dawn uh, site. They've got a lot of great stuff up there, including lesson plans, um, things you can bring to the classroom, to your students, to your kids. Uh, and we're working on one at CosmoQuest as well called Investigate. Yes, that was on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can also uh, tie in your asteroid mapper citizen science. Into yeah. Oh, yeah. Asteroid mappers. Yeah, we still have the Vesta images that still need to be looked at. Like, there's yeah. so much data. <laughs> we need, <laughs> we really need help there. with that asteroid mappers data. So be sure to go to CosmoQuest and uh, choose Asteroid Mappers to explore the surface of Vesta. You will get slightly addicted, I guarantee you. <laughs> Personal guarantee, because I have already. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, if, if you're looking to our... Uh, you, or were you going to go and have them look for their forward-looking moments? or? Oh, yeah. Let's. Um, yeah, I was just going to say tomorrow... Um, Tomorrow is the weekly space hangout with uh, Fraser Kane will be hosting. That's at noon Pacific. We'll be covering probably the last two weeks worth of space and astronomy news since uh, since uh, we we took off for the holiday. And you'll get all your comet ISON updates from us tomorrow. Uh, virtual star party is Sunday evening. It's now at 6 p.m. Pacific. So be sure to tune into that. Look through the t our uh, astronomers' telescopes all over all over the world and. Uh, without leaving your warm bedroom. It's, it's great, I'm telling you. Uh, as, and uh, then Monday is Astronomy Cast, so be sure to, to tune in as Fraser Kane and Pamela Gay record a live episode of Astronomy Cast on Google Hangouts and answer your questions as well. So with those out of the way, I'd like to get from each of you your, your final thoughts on what you'd most like to see uh, when Dawn gets to series. Well, I'm on record as uh, hoping for fish already, so... Uh... <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to stick with that one. But I'll just close by saying that it's been just tremendous fun for me to work with the Dawn team, a really great team of scientists and engineers um, over these years, and I look forward to more of it. It's been great fun for me, and I think uh, just really satisfying to know that the Hubble Space Telescope has been able to uh, provide all kinds of support and enhance the mission of Dawn. And uh, I hope that, I certainly expect that collaboration to continue. Awesome. Jen Yang? 
Yeah, well, uh, similar to Max, I really, really want to see a lot of water on series. We know there might be a lot, but we haven't seen it yet, so that's what I wanted. <clears throat> and Brittany? Oh, yeah, you guys have heard this a lot for me. <laughs> Let's hear again. <laughs> uh, what am I going to pick this time? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm looking, you know, I'm looking for things that, that tell me there's ice underneath there. Yeah. So that's what, that's what I'll be looking forward for. Very cool. Uh, for me personally, although okay, my my camera's freaking out. Um, I will be looking for more questions to include on the Science Olympiad test since this series is a featured object for oh, the yeah. Science Olympiad test that I just uh, did an invitational for. So uh, I'll be looking to uh, grill those middle school students on their series knowledge. So yeah, keep it coming. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks for joining us on this special little hangout. Thank Bye, everybody. you. Yeah.